We're going to go ahead and start it talking about the French Revolution, right? So, of course, we're going to have to talk about some backgrounds. And we're going to kind of just jump into it. And let's start with Louis, oh, Louis the Fourteenth. The now, Louis the Fourteenth. Got to start kind of on a, on a pedestal. You got to start when things are, when things are. Well, I'm not sure things were good. Depends on who we were talking about, right? But uh, oh, Louis the Fourteenth. Uh, he reigned from, uh, uh, you know, 1643 to seven uh, to 1715. Uh, he came to the throne uh, at the ripe old age of well, five. <laughs> so, uh, and so, who was in charge at that time? Well, it's Cardinal Mazarin. Uh, was in charge. Uh, he was the chief minister uh, throughout his childhood, um, uh, and he what he did is is that he strove for direct royal administration of France, uh, and so, so even already at that time, uh, things are getting uh, powers becoming uh, more focused upon uh, the uh, royalty. Right, and then there's there's something that happened, an occasion that happens called the Fronde Rebellion. So uh, this is the reaction of the the French nobles against this growing centralized authority. Uh, and these occur between 1649 to 1652. Uh, by the way, Fronde. This is named after a slingshot that was used by street boys. So, so the Frondes in Paris helped influence Louis to want to basically move out the country. Uh, he didn't want to be a part of the local rabble. He didn't like the populace. He wasn't really into the people. <laughs> and he realized that the uh, Paris can uh, can be moody at some times, uh, you know, one way or the other. And uh, things haven't changed very much. If you're Parisian, hello. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a city that has its moods. And um, and people protest a lot, and there's violence, and he didn't feel safe. And I mean, he did do a few things for, for Paris, like, for example, uh, he gave them street lighting. But, uh, you know, he really preferred to be as far away from the city as possible. Of course, we're talking about the foundation of Versailles within that context. So, so now, uh, it, but Louis in his later years, um, when Mazarin uh, died in, in, in 16, uh, 61. Louis was then at the age of 23, and he, at this point, uh, he assumed direct control of France. Now, he did not try to interfere with politics on a local level. Um, he, uh, uh, he believed that uh, noble interests actually could endanger France, and so he attempted to relieve them of their power. Tried to relieve them of their power. <laughs> so... So Louis, what he did first of all is he appointed a no chief minister. Uh, this uh, this made uh, the nobles answerable only to the king. Therefore, they could not blame the minister for making poor decisions. But they were now directly accountable for their actions to the king, the great Sun King. Obviously, this is the stirrings of absolutism. Uh, Louis created some strong councils uh, that had a, a chief minister over each one, uh, directly, of course, uh, below him. These selected chief ministers were often those who were part of families that were long loyal uh, to his family, and they happened to be <laughs> outside of the typical noble circles. Uh, he wanted outside of the hierarchy. He liked the outsiders. Uh, Louis he did spend quite a few hours with these ministers uh, who, of course, you know, they had no power base uh, to, uh, uh, to to threaten them at all, right? So they're, they're, they're completely uh, they're completely vulnerable uh, to him. And he, he liked that. He, he liked himself quite a bit. <laughs> so uh, the sun and the moon uh, he was the sun. I guess they said the moon and the planet really did orbit around him, right? Now, what will happen is, is that, um, uh, well, um, he kept the traditional nobles uh, directly out of power positions. And as a result, uh, you know, the Louis became wealthy. Um, 
And um, he did pursue some wars with his neighbors, which unfortunately did, did weaken France. But as I said before, he did create the idea of, uh, or not create, but part of the idea known as absolutism. Of uh, course, absolutism, we'll talk at length in a few moments. Well, um, I would just say, actually, I'll talk about it right now. Uh, there was a, uh, he was influenced by a certain bishop, Jacques Bousset. Uh, and um, this is a, a political theorist, various ideas concerning his royal privilege. Uh, and so the idea is in direct opposition to parliamentary uh, rule that we see, like, for example, in, in England, Bousset asserted the idea of the long held idea of the divine right of kings. Bousset believed that the, the Old Testament uh, supported the idea of rulers uh, as directly appointed by and answerable only to God alone. So if only God could judge a pope, Bousset then believed that only God could judge maybe the king as well. <laughs> and that was his logic. And because they were both appointed and anointed by God as his earthly regents. They were not answerable to either the nobility or the parliament. No, they're answered to God alone. Okay, so uh, Louis uh, allegedly uh, said uh, that um, uh, le state c'est moi. You know, he'd said that I am the state. <laughs> uh, in fact, his emblem was, was the sun. He was the, the sun king, right? And in fact, he even played, I got to tell you this, he played Apollo uh, in a royal ballet. <laughs> so, wow. So he did like himself quite a bit. Other things, of course, is uh, he established a place known as Versailles. We have to talk about this. So Versailles was built between uh, 1676 and 1708. But I want to say that it was originally a hunting lodge uh, Louis, uh, the, um, uh, Louis the Louis the and uh, and so what he did is Louis the Fourteenth transformed uh, this this uh, this uh, hunting lodge uh, into a, a very extensive permanent residence. Uh, he he lived there permanently after 1682. Uh, Louis used the Versailles Palace to assert his absolutist control. Um, you know, um, it was a, a temple, a temple designated for the glory of the Sun King. It was magnificent with gardens and fountains. In fact, uh, uh, it had uh, 372 statues, 600 fountains. Uh, it had hundreds of thousands of plants that all bloomed. I mean, it was spectacular to look at. But you know what? I gotta tell you something. The spectacular to look at, the smell, whoo, it was such the when the blooms blossomed, it was such a strong scent that it actually actually made people sick. <laughs> that's, that's how many how it blooms. I mean, too many, way too many. Uh, these gardens were beautiful, but um, a little a little overwhelming. Of course, we have the famous. Uh, Hall of Mirrors, uh, which have, of course, obviously 357 mirrors. Uh, you know, the Venetians are the ones uh, who perfect the the use of mirrors, and Louis, you know, wanted that. And of course, there's lots of stories that uh, uh, they, they 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 took uh, these Venetian Venetian artisans and had them, you know, create these mirrors for him. And of course, obviously, there's also stories about the Venetians declaring that anybody who takes their secrets anywhere else, uh, they had the monopoly on the business, uh, would suffer pain of death. That's just a thought. Well, there is evidence to say that the Venetians were not mad, were actually not only mad, wanted to do something about it. And um, two of those who were extrapolated <laughs> uh, uh, from, from, from Venice were uh, found dead. So, ooh, mystery, right? Everybody loves a mystery. And, you know, this, this, this Hall of Mirrors was absolutely beautiful. It, um, I want to tell you that uh, on special occasions, I just want you to imagine this. They had 20,000 
candles, special occasions, placed in this hall. And they said it just shimmered like diamonds. Oh, and uh, they had menageries, they had, you know, you know, animals and exotic ones and so forth. I mean, this place, this is a palace, a big one. The heart was no longer Paris. The heart was beating at Versailles. Well, of course, a palace of this size uh, uh, literally uh, had thousands of, of, uh, of people who worked there, uh, and of course, servants and royal officials and important nobles. Um, you know, and uh, of course, obviously, these nobles were excluded uh, from a lot of public service thanks to his <laughs> manipulation, right? Uh, so that means, in fact, it, it's estimated that they had, there's about 5,000, 5,000 nobles lived in the area or there. And that's a lot. In fact, there's so many, how many nobles is that the kitchen, the feed all these people? It was, it was so much that uh, by the time we got to Louis, uh, the food was cold. <laughs> by the way, uh, later on, uh, Louis the Fifteenth made his own private kitchen. Good idea. But uh, moving right along, uh, so these nobles had no choice but to appeal to to old Louis. Uh, so they had to be close to him because that's the only way they're going to be able to get any kind of patronage, right? Because as he kind of unhinged them from any kind of public responsibility, so uh, they're dependent upon him. He's smart, right? So uh, they they tended to his daily tasks in a subservient manner. Uh, just to get his ear. Sometimes uh, they held his night candle, and sometimes they helped him uh, dress. Sometimes they held his uh, when he had to go, you know, go to the restroom. They hold it, held his, uh, his, you know, you know, uh, chamber pot, <laughs> just to uh, just to get get his ear right. So, of course, noble attachment to Louis's court did increase their prestige. For now, he was in control. He's in control of their pensions, right? He's in control of their privileges. And so they had to, in order for them to live according to the rank, they had to, had to uh, be there at court with him. Then he did something else that was pretty mischievous. Um, Versailles itself, its lifestyle, it was a, a gluttony and entertainments and everything that's lavish and this distracted these nobles it distracted them with all the sexual delights uh, to the point where because the thoughts of entertainments kept on going in their attention these these comforts made them fat it made them lazy uh it made them apathetic he just so basically he brought him in took away their responsibilities <laughs> they're dependent on him and then he just then he just slowly eroded away uh their confidence uh, uh, and made them lazy and gluttonous. And well, that's a good way to, in a sense, uh, domesticate the nobles, right? He, of course, obviously, he had constant displays of power. Uh, uh, and, and of course, he, <laughs> the other thing I want to bring up is that um, the draw of the court uh, kept them away from, the, from their estates. And so under, the, you know, and therefore was under his constant eye, he he broke these regional ties because they're always there watching him, right? He made it difficult, obviously, because through his decentralization of their power, through the centralization of his power, <laughs> uh, he made it difficult for them to form any kind of union against them. Uh, so it, it kind of alleviated any kind of plots and so forth. And that, that is old Louis. Okay, so Louis, oh, by the way, just a little bit of fun trivia. You know, he moved uh, into his palace in 1682, another great event happened there at that year. Of, uh, in 1682, also, uh, in the New World, <laughs> uh, there, was this, there was this guy, Cabinet, uh, who was canoeing down the Mississippi, uh, and he came down to the basin there, and he went, oh, wow, I'm going to name this area after Louis. And that's where we get the name Louisiana. <laughs> what well, a takeaway. So Louisiana is named after the Sun King. Uh, who knew? Okay. Uh, he did, unfortunately, persecutions against the, the Huguenots. Uh, Louis wished to make France 
under one religion, that'd be Catholicism. So we revoked the Edict of Nantes, if that which was, of course, commenced in 1598. So in October of 1685, uh, this edict was withdrawn. Uh, these Calvinistic Huguenots, the king ordered all Protestant churches and schools closed, all Protestant ministers exiled, or those who were laity that refused to convert, they became galley slaves. Wow. All, in fact, the Protestant children were forced to be baptized with by Catholic priests. So the Huguenots made a mass exit out of France. Uh, more than a quarter of a million people, they, they flee to England, Holland, and yes, uh, the New World. So many of you who have French background may trace it back to the Huguenots who came specifically more often to the South uh, fleeing this. Uh, so that's that's old Louis. Now what's going to happen is we get uh, to the next one. So Louis, uh, he passes away, and we get to Louis the Fifteenth. Uh, now, of course, Louis the Fourteenth died in gangrene. Uh, you, you know he reigned for for seventy two years. That's a long time, right? But uh, so the next Louis, Louis the Fifteenth, seventeen fifteen to seventeen seventy four. Uh, we're getting close. He succeeded his great grandfather at the tender age of also five years of age. Uh, uh, unlike Louis uh, the Fourteenth, Louis the Fifteenth was considered weak, making decisions that were believed to weaken France and make it vulnerable for the revolution. I want to say this. I want to make it very clear: we have to talk about Louis the Fifteenth if we're going to be talking about the French Revolution. I know we're going. Oh, we're going to get to the French Revolution. You have to understand where it comes from. <laughs> you have to understand the origins. That means you gotta understand Louis the Fifteenth, because this is the setup, you know, cause, you know, there's a cause to these. So Louis the Fifteenth is part of this. Got it? So we're already talking about what's gonna happen further on. So Louis the Fifteenth, um, he weakened the the French, they believe, militarily, economically. Uh, and many lost faith in the I ideals of the absolute monarchy that was brought in by Louis the Fourteenth, um, and um, and so uh, what will happen is uh, the first one. I will just talk about Louis just in general. Uh, Louis, uh, just to get to know Louis the Fifteenth, uh, <laughs> getting to know him. I got to tell you, uh, I don't. I like Louis the Fifteenth. I don't know. I mean, uh, sort of. I mean. You know, he he was he was actually approachable. Uh, he, by the way, hot chocolate was his favorite drink. It was considered luxurious at that time. So, uh, anyways, so you know, so when you go to Versailles, you can look forward to you know, yeah, maybe wine, maybe a fine drink. But no, he was he, he, he just had some hot chocolate. <laughs> um, and it was considered a luxury at that time, and he, it was also considered aphrodisiac. So. Uh, he would give hot chocolate to his mistresses. Um, a Duke de Croix uh, talks about him, uh, a description. So I'm giving you a description of Louis, uh, you know, from, uh, from that, that period. And, and he says as follows about Louis the Fifteenth. He says he had a great, he had a memory, presence, and justness of spirit that was unique. He was gentle, an excellent father, and, and the most honest individual in the world. Uh, he was well informed in the sciences, but with a modesty which, with him, was always a vice. He always saw more correctly than others, but he always believed he was wrong. He had the greatest bravery, and a bravery that was too modest. Louis, he continues, Louis the Fourteenth had been too proud, but Louis the Fifteenth was not proud enough. Other than his Excessive modesty, he goes on. His his great and sole vice was was women. <laughs> he believed his mistresses loved him enough to tell him the truth. For that reason, he allowed them to lead him. When uh, which of course contributed to the failure with finance, uh, which was the worst aspect of his reign. Yeah, another another his minister of war said this about him. He said that he's extremely shy. He said he seemed to want to speak, but his timidity stopped him, 
and the expressions did not come. One felt that he wanted to say something obligingly, but he often ended up by simply asking a frivolous question. So, uh, so he's not as he's not he's not Louis the Fourteenth. And this is now that we have a comparison. This is going to cause some problems. The French lose respect for him and the position of the monarch in general. So slowly things are starting to erode away here. Uh, the, the war of Austrian succession was one of these interesting triggers. And this is where they see his weakness. Uh, uh, what happened is, long story really short, but uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia, he decided to invade and annex the Austrian province of Silesia. Silesia uh, uh, is known for its central location right along the trade routes and has rich minerals and uh, natural resources. People, everybody wants Silesia, right? That's near Poland. So Cardinal Fleury, which is who is also working obviously with Louis uh, the the fifteenth, uh, uh, was quite old at this time, and he be really became ineffective, uh, and from stopping uh, the court from having conflict, and so so what happens is that um, Louis decided to uh, enter into the war on the side of the of the Prussians, so this conflict lasted. Seven years, but uh, the war in the German regions did not go as planned because the Austrians uh, started to win, and the French had to pull back. And the war in northern Italy was a stalemate. But the war in the Netherlands is different. I, I'm sorry, I have to tell you the story. The war in the Netherlands was different. What happened there is that um, um, you know uh, the Austrians. Uh, who are also with, uh, aligned with the British and the Dutch, were losing uh, to the French. They were losing. So victory after the victory. So the French were able to gain, uh, by 1746, they're able to occupy Brussels, and he marched in triumph, and it turned out that the French occupied all of the Austrian Netherlands, which is modern-day Belgium as well as parts of even the northern part of the Netherlands. I mean, he, he, the French won. The French were going, yay, we won. You know, patriotism is running high. You know, this is great. Oh, is it? So, so came the time to negotiate the peace treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle in 1748. But Louis, oh, Louis, desired to act as an arbitrator and not a conqueror. He did something that upset the French and made um, his others very happy with him. Louis agreed to restore all of his conquests, all of them, back to those defeated enemies. He declared that, that, that I am king of France, not a shopkeeper. And while this was viewed as chivalrous, this was you know, I mean, the French were like, what? Hey, what? It's victory. We should conquer the lands. But he didn't, he didn't believe that. He believed that he wanted to restore order. That's why we were there. You know, to restore order, not, not for conquest. And the French attacked him. It's as stupid as the peace. The work for the king of Prussia, working for nothing. I mean, they, they just ridiculed him. Uh, they began to focus upon his character, attack him, especially for his series of affairs, which and infidelities, which he had quite a few, uh, so many that uh, uh, he made his his wife, uh, his queen, uh, blush uh, and retreat to various charities and religious acts. I mean, uh, at one point, he had a series of love affairs with four sisters, uh, the Millet Nestle family uh, sisters, and he subsequently had for them one at a time. I went through all four. In some cases, there's a fifth one in there, too. So, yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, during the War of Austrian Succession, uh, he took uh, one of them, uh, Marie Anne de Melay, along with him, who was basically saying, you know what? Everybody looks at, down on you. They don't respect you. Uh, and they said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make you strong. I'm going to try to make you brave. As 
And so she encouraged him. And in fact, he, he kept yelling at her, you're, you're killing me. And she responded, sire, a king must come to life again. <laughs> it's like, he's like, no, he wants to be softy. He doesn't want to do these, these, he doesn't want to be his uh, Louis the 14th. He doesn't want to be him. He wants to be a good king. He did, um, you know, but, uh, you know, and he, did, he listened to his mistress. Uh, uh, no, he didn't. Uh, and next followed the Seven Year War. This is another big part. So now, thinking, thinking that this is all part of the French Revolution, we're actually right in the middle of it. You don't know it, we are. <laughs> so that way, the first one is lots of respect for Louis the Fifteenth and the position of the king. What's next? The Seven Year War. This is the next thing that's one of the causes. Seven-year war from 1755 to 1764 really is the first world war. I know we, we think of the one, you know, the 1914, 1981, and the first part of the 20th century as a world war, but this war was a war that went all the way around the world. Everybody was fighting. Well, not everybody was quite a few, just as many involved as a World War One or a World War Two. You want to tell me where? I'm telling you where, where right now. Uh, so, so basically, there's fighting in Europe. There is fighting in North America. There is fighting in Central America. There is fighting in West Africa. There are fighting in India. There are fighting in the Philippine Islands. There are fighting in areas of Oceania. I mean, there was fighting everywhere going on there. So, um, yeah, and um, and of course, the basic lines of division. Uh, was between Great Britain and France, Great Britain and France. Now, the Seven Year War is known by many different names. In the United States, it's called the French and Indian War. In French Canada, it's called the War of Conquest. For Sweden and Prussia, it's called the Pomeranian War. For India, it's called the Third Carnic War. Uh, you know, for Prussia and Austria, it's called uh, the Third Silesian War. Yeah, yeah. But you get the idea. Everybody's fighting. Now, the trigger... <laughs> Of this world war is fascinating. What happened is, is that in the new world, of course, you have the 13 colonies. And these colonies, the colonists of the British colonies, uh, colonists, they're, they're slowly expanding and they're looking at the Ohio River Valley. And uh, they're expanding out there. Meanwhile, the French claim Ohio and claim this area for themselves. And so and along the Mississippi. So the French, they established a series of forts in this area. Uh, and so what will happen is now you can see the, the British are, are settling uh, close to the forts, and there's going to be a fight. It's going to happen. And so the French proceeded to build a fort they know as Fort Busconnect, uh, and a British colonial militia from Virginia were sent there to drive them out. And who was the person to drive them out? At least try to drive them out. His name was George Washington. George Was George Washington. They ambushed uh, a small French force at Juvier Glen on uh, May 28, 1754, killing ten, including the commander. The French retaliated by attacking Washington's army at Fort Necessity. On July 3rd, 1754, and George Washington was forced to surrender. And that's the start of this great world war. <laughs> Leave it to George. It's George's fault. <laughs> You're like, whoa. <laughs> and now we think of, of him in, in the Revolutionary War. We think of him as president. We don't think of him as a guy who's, who's, who's the trigger for the, the, this massive seven year war, but he is. Uh, and he's, and uh, uh, he was actually forced to, to sign something. His French wasn't that good, I guess, uh, admitting uh, to doing all this as well. And that caused a lot of problems. So now you have news spread. Uh, Great Britain and France dispatch uh, their regular troops to North America uh, to enforce their claims, while uh, Great Britain sees hundreds of French merchant ships. Uh, then the Prussians, who are watching along, uh, they allied themselves. Britain, you have another kind of cross-alliance thing, decided to take the opportunity to seize Saxony for the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, from Austria. Then the Austrians decide, hey, we want Silesia again. <laughs> We're going to take Silesia. 
uh, which which is what's under the realm. You remember they lost it uh, from Prussia, declared war on them. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, there's a fear of the Baltic region. You can see where this is going. This triggers off, and then Spain and Portugal, yada, yada. It's a mess. It's a world war. This is still a trigger. It's still a trigger. Finally, the Seven Year War came to a close with the Treaty of Paris in 1763. Here it is. Great Britain received most of New France in North America. That will be Canada. It will also, Great Britain will receive Florida uh, from Spain, who was allied with France, but, you know, along with some of the Caribbean islands uh, in the West Indies and Senegal in the West African coast. Also, uh, Great Britain gained supremacy in India over France. So now, wow. So now the, the competition for India, it goes on the side uh, of Great Britain. Still, while Spain lost Florida, they gained French Louisiana as compensation, uh, and their former colonies of Cuba and the Philippines were returned to them. Prussia, uh, under uh, Frederick the Great, uh, did well, consolidated its power. Meanwhile, you're thinking, okay, I got this. Meanwhile, who's going to pay for the debt of the war? The French, because they lost. Okay, wait a second. The French. So wait, the, the French are stuck with paying the war debt? Yeah. Which, of course, this is going to really erode the monarchy of Louis XV. Uh, because guess what? Now France is in debt to pay the debt off. So we're going to pay this enormous debt. Well, if a country goes in debt, how do you pay that off? You raise taxes. Oh, uh, you know, just kind of like, um, <laughs> you know, Britain did this too a little bit, raising taxes in, in, in America. So this, are you guys following me? Yeah. So after the death, conveniently, Louis, uh, he he dies um, in um, in 1774, and Louis the 16th takes over, and he becomes king of France. So he ruled directly after his grandfather, uh, and he's now stuck with a mess, a big mess. Now there's all this debt has to be paid off, and a lot of people who don't want to pay it. <laughs> and a lot of people don't want to pay it. Louis was very progressive. Uh, he encouraged uh, ideas of the Enlightenment. Uh, uh, in fact, he, he wanted to apply these ideas to his reign. Uh, he wished Catholics to become more tolerant of other people's beliefs. He believed that uh, Louis XIV was wrong. In fact, he pushed through legislation to protect non-Catholics. Next, he did something that was pretty good that people don't recognize. And I don't know why he doesn't get this credit. Louis officially abolished serfdom. Did you know there were serfs all the way up as an institution, all the way up until his reign? He abolished it altogether. No longer were peasants tied to the land. I mean, this is a big deal. This is, this is a good thing. He's doing something that is right. Then he abolished the tailing, which was a tax imposed upon the peasants, which was determined upon the number of people in each household and how much land that they had. He got rid of that. But the French, so he's, he's basically helping the people, the peasants, right? The poor, those who are underprivileged. He's doing this. Who is he going to make angry? He's going to make the nobles angry. The nobles are not going to like him. That's the, real, that's the reality. And so they resented his reforms. As advised by his minister, Turgot, he deregulated the gray market. You know, but uh, this resulted in the rise of, of bed prices. And, uh, you know, and then, of course, after a few bad harvests following these reforms, the price of bread rose significantly, uh, and the French are getting upset. And we're back to another problem, is that, well, the, the farmers need to be paid for what they have. But at the same time, we need to have something that's affordable, too. So there you have it. Louis, 
Uh, Louis the Sixteenth. Let's get to know Louis. Louis um, again. Uh, you know, he was he was shy too, like Louis the Fifteenth. He loved his studies. Uh, his favorite topics were history and geography and astronomy. He enjoyed Latin. He was fluent in English and Italian. Uh, his hobby was watchmaking. He loved making watches, and he also loved locksmithing. Uh, he loved to tinker around. Yeah. Uh, he married uh, Marie Antoinette, or Antonio, right, Antonia, in 1770. Uh, so he was 15. Uh, she was 14. Um, I got to tell you, they only met uh, two days before uh, their wedding. Uh, he, uh, she was his second cousin, twice removed. Uh, she was the daughter of Francis I. Uh, he was the, the Holy Roman uh, emperor, right, uh, based in, of course, obviously, Austria, the, right, uh, whose wife was Maria Theresa, the, the empress. Okay, so what happened, though, is this. Already, the French are upset. The French, now we understand why, the French uh, are not happy about this because they're angry over the Seven-Year War. They're angry over the Seven-Year War, uh, and, um, and, of course, obviously, they were with Austria in this mess. And so they felt resentful and said, well, why in the world, then, <laughs> are you creating this marriage between who we don't like that caused us this great debt <laughs> because of the Seven-Year War? I mean, why would you do this? So the people are angry. They don't really see uh, Marie Antoinette as an outsider. Uh, she's, she's not one of us. She's not, she's not French. Uh, and so... Uh, so they, they already hate her. I uh, just want to tell you, they already hate her because uh, the resentment of the set. Now you're, you guys are following this. You guys are getting, oh, this is part of that. Yes, it is. Part of the reasons of the resentment. They hate her. Uh, that some already wanted her dead. <laughs> you know, uh, there you have it. Um, and so um, well, and there, the things are not going well between uh, old Louis and his new wife either. Uh, uh, I'll be a little delicate about it. They failed to uh, consummate their union uh, uh, in uh, uh, in 1770 and in 1771 and in 1772 and in 1773. Although there's one claim that he did, but others say no. He didn't consummate in 1774 or 1775 or 1776. So you've seen the problem here. Only it happened in 1777. So, you know, the idea is, of course, you want to have offspring. This is not happening. And so a lot of people are thinking, um, there's some difficulties going on here, right? Um, so what happened is um, there's lots of theories. There's websites. Everything's devoted to what's really going on with Louis. Uh, you know, um, uh, many people say, well, Louis was just really clumsy in bed. <laughs> and Maria was just uninterested. And there's there's truth to that. There really is. Uh, uh, Joseph II, uh, who visited uh, uh, the unhappy couple, <laughs> uh, who's obviously uh, Marie Antoinette's uh, brother, uh, he actually wrote a letter about this, and he said that uh, they are uh, complete fumblers <laughs> when it comes to uh, their their bedroom activities. Um, but boy, Marie had her own opinion. She wrote this down that he introduced his member and then stays there without moving for two minutes. So anyway, so things are not going very well. And so you can see what's going to happen. Now the gossip is going, well, he's not really a man, you know? Oh, so in these rumors, so the pamphlets are spreading. And this is undermining his, uh, his uh, what's going on with him. There's in fact obscene pamphlets that would go out saying and friend, obviously, can the king do it? Can't the king do it? These are some of the things they would say. So things are not going very well. Fortunately, um, he got some advice and some training. And so uh, in, in the arts of love. Uh, and finally she became pregnant with a child in 1778. And they had four children after that. And they also adopted six children. Now there's lots of claims that maybe. Uh, circumcision, he was circumcised, or, you know, after or whatever. So there's lots of things where I had some kind of uh, situation, intimacy, but whatever. But we're, we got it. Anyway, so 
there we go. But that was that was still hurtful to his reign. He was very intelligent, but he relied too much on his advisors. Uh, he liked his leisure time quite a bit, and he indulged too much. Uh, he didn't know how to say no to anybody. He was on Marie Antoinette. Oh, boy. Marie Antoinette, she's known for her poofs. You know, she had, you know, her hairdos were like three feet high. I'm sorry, I'm not joking, three feet high. Uh, that's really teased up there. Uh, Panache, uh, she had, she, she had like this, this, these plumes of flowers, right? Uh, she did something that kind of irritated the French. Uh, she wore English dresses made out of ande. Uh, these, this is a, basically, this is a, 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 a fabric that's printed or painted on uh, to, using like metallic salts to fix the dye. And what happened, did you guys know that uh, this particular um, andele, andele, excuse me, was illegal in France? It was banned from 1689 to 1759 because it threatened the French textile industry because they didn't, weren't able to do this. They didn't produce this. And so, it, so what happened is, is that there's this conflict. Even though uh, it was now legal, the fact that she is wearing this, this English clothes used with using these fabrics was looked at down upon as an insult to, to the French. Uh, and so, oh, you, you, she really is not one of us. Uh, then uh, she did something else. She abandoned heavy makeup. Just don't do this. She wanted to go for the simple feminine look. And she wore, wore gowns with a cutaway, draped and swaggered overskirt. And, uh, I mean, she just, but she still led people in fashion. Uh, she also uh, enjoyed starring in various amateur plays and musicals. And once again, a lot of people just did not like her. Marie Antoinette, she had her own separate estate on the property, had its own theater, its own farm area, a temple of love uh, with a statue of Cupid, a private grotto that was cave-like, uh, a library of 5,000 books. Many claimed during the 1780s that she had some rendezvous here. Uh, others uh, claimed that she was connected to what's called the German vice, uh, that she was a lesbian. And so that was one of the claims that was going around. And that claim is still being popularized today uh, in many kinds of films. So that's that's a little bit about the what we, so you can see already, uh, things are stacked high, a little too high already uh, for this unfortunate couple. I mean, I feel like we're already ready. We're, we're getting ready for this. So next, we had this debt, right? You know, the French debt. Uh, it gets worse. Next, under Louis, the French supported the American Revolution, which exasperated further the French financial difficulties. Uh, now, given uh, what happened now is, well, now the government was enabled to collect sufficient taxes to service and repay the debt. They, you know, they're still trying to get over the Seven Year War, and then all of a sudden, what? They support the Americans and this freedom idea? Come on, Louis the Sixteenth. I like him. I'm sorry. He, he's trying. He's trying to be good. He's, you know, he wants wants us, you know, the United States to to be about right. So, but uh, what happened is is that um, now France is going further in debt. People are more resentful because, you know, we want to have, we don't want to pay the taxes. So Louis the Sixteenth appointed several different ministers to deal with the financial crisis, all failed to persuade the aristocracy and the church to pay more taxes. We're not, we're not going to do it. No, we're not going to pay more taxes. No. Oh, no. Well, we got it. So Louis said, you got to pay more taxes. We're in trouble. <laughs> we're going into debt. We Oh, so much, and then plus all these other things are going on. You know the you know the, the farms. Uh, we have this, this, this situations uh, going on with farms and and the blight and so forth. And and so they so they say the nobles the church say you know what? Only the estates general can institute new taxes. That's it. Only the estates general. And he's like, the estates general. Um, <clears throat> they haven't met. Since 1614, <laughs> you know, this is 1788. 
So you want me to resurrect this defunct institution that hasn't met 1614 just for, for us to agree to raise taxes? Uh-huh. So Louis gave in to convene the Estates General the next year, which is now um, 1789. Now, the Estates General had three divisions. You had first the, the first estate, which is for the clergy. The second estate, that's the nobility. The nobility. The third estate represents everyone else in the kingdom. So you got three estates, got it? Clergy, nobility, and everybody else. Now, before the estates uh, general met in Versailles, May of 1789, there had been much debate over how to organize this. The monarchy had agreed that the third estate, you know, with, with everybody else, could have twice as many members as either the nobility or the clergy. But then there arose a debate over how good it would be organized. The nobility, of course, wanted all votes to be taken by estates. That means everybody gets one vote. See a problem here? Let's see, one vote. Well, let's see. Let's see, nobles get one vote, church gets one vote, and the third estate gets one vote. So therefore, <laughs> you pay the taxes, right? Well, the church is going to say, well, we're not paying, if it's pay, paying for it. <laughs> now, the nobles are, we're not paying for it. But guess what? Of course, the, the third estate, who's the people, uh, you know, they go unanimous, right? But, uh, so you can see what's, what's happening. It's, it's not fair, right? Uh, so what happens is the third estate wanted each member to vote individually so that with its large membership would dominate, which makes sense. The people would be in charge. But, um, and so this, this third estate composed mostly of large, uh, largely of, of officials, uh, local officials, professional men, uh, lawyers. Uh, and for several years, for several years, for several uh, weeks, there's a stand. Then on June 1st, the third estate invited the clergy and the nobles to join it in forming another legislative body. Let's not, let's not stay with the estates general. Let's form another one. Okay, so, okay. And we'll call it the National Assembly. So, so the third estate, they show up <laughs> as the National Assembly, uh, and uh, they go to their usual meeting place, and they find themselves, you know, locked out. Ooh, I wonder what happened. <laughs> so they moved to a nearby tennis court, uh, where members took the famous tennis court oath to continue to sit until France has a new constitution. So, so the National Assembly is we're going to we're the, we're the third state. <laughs> you know, we're one third of the uh, states general, but we we kind of broken away, and, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have this uh, national assembly. But we want other people to join us. Louis, of course, orders the national assembly to to stop to desist. But shortly afterwards, some of the clergy go, "Okay, maybe we'll join this whole assembly." Uh, and some of the nobles say, "Well, we'll join this national assembly too." Some of them, just some. And then on June 27th, uh, Louis says, okay, that's official. All of the first estate and the second estate have to join the National Assembly, you know, for a constitution. That's, that's not a bad thing. And voting will occur by individual, by head, rather than order. That's fair. Louis, you're fair. Hi, you're fair. Although he's, he's going under trepidation. <laughs> He's not really wanting to do this. He's reluctant. These are new ideas. Uh, so, you know, he's, you know, you know, if, if it didn't have the, uh, the pressure, he probably wouldn't do it, but he's doing it. So the government, uh, by the privilege orders, thus ended. So the Estates General is gone. And the National Assembly became uh, existent. Well, now, of course, you know, because it's France. <laughs> if you're French, you like this. Because it's France, uh, it's time uh, it's a national assembly, but we got to change our name because you know now we have uh, everybody there. So we're going to be putting together a constitution. So we're going to change our name from the national assembly 
to the National Constituent Assembly. The National Constituent. So National Assembly, the National Constituent. Because he had to change the name. So there's two situations that happen. First, Louis uh, uh, the 16th attempted to regain the initiative by, uh, by bringing troops near Versailles and Paris. He's a little bit worried about what's going to happen. Uh, and so, and this was poorly organized, right? He's afraid that there could be a revolution that could happen. Uh, most of the National Constituent Assembly wished to create some form of constitutional monarchy, which would include Louis. But uh, Louis's refusal at first kind of stopped that effect. And so uh, they were not sure if they wanted to reward him or not to becoming a constitutional monarch. The second situation, of course, is the populace of Paris. And so there is a, a, a mustering of, of troops uh, that uh, uh, start to go about the city uh, because there's bread riots that are happening. And once again, he's, he's nervous. <laughs> That's going to be a bad situation. By June, the Parisians were already organizing a citizen militia and collecting arms. So should Louis be afraid? Yes, he should be, because Paris uh, is trying to arm itself and organize itself. Then the Bastille. The Bastille was this great fortress, amazing looking, uh, built between 1370s and 1380s. It guarded the eastern approach to Paris, uh, very useful during the Hundred Year War. Uh, Louis the Fourteenth found it useful to throw his enemies, especially upper his noble enemies, uh, in in there if they weren't you know, likely to have enough. And so, so a lot of people saw this, uh, this this is a symbol of oppression. On July Fourteenth, around uh, eight hundred people, uh, most of them uh, artisans and involved in trades and shopkeepers, uh, marched to the Bastille to this fortress in search of weapons for this militia that they just created. This, of course, this fortress once had some, some pretty uh, famous uh, political prisoners. But I got to tell you, at this point, the Bastille, it's huge. It's an enormous castle, enormous fortress, was pretty much empty. So it was how empty? Well, uh, it, it held at this time when they stormed the Bastille, uh, it held only seven inmates. There's only seven in that giant prison. Uh, uh, there were uh, two forgers, uh, two lunatics, one defined as a, as a deviant, uh, an aristocrat, right? Uh, and um, and the Marquis de Sade, who, um, you know, um, who was going to be released pretty soon. Now, what happened is this. They're thinking about closing this place down. It's already on its way out. Um, it was it was it was expensive to maintain this medieval fortress and even the garrison that went along with it, uh, and so the decision was made that uh, we're going to go ahead decommission this and and end this as a fortress. But uh, uh, what happened though is that um, uh, the people are, are rushing upon the Bastille, and the governor of the fortress. Uh, what happened is that. Um, well, uh, he was not very good. I'll just say that. And uh, uh, what happens is the troops of the Bastille basically fired into the crowd, killing 98 people and wounding many others. Well, the crowd obviously stormed the, the, the Bastille. They released the seven prisoners uh, and then killed several soldiers, as well as the inept governor. And they didn't find any weapons. After all that, they didn't find any weapons. But this is the steel day. <laughs> this is July 14th. You guys heard of this is the big day. So this is one of the this is one of those pivotal moments, right? Now, uh, it really shocked people. Uh, Edmund Burke, at the storm of the Bastille, Edmund Burke, who's he's British, he's watching this, he already realizes there's a problem. The rabble of the populace. Are going to are going to this is going to continue. A mob is going to grow. He says, as to us here, at being in England, he's watching this unfold, this revolution unfold uh, in France. He says, as to us here, 
our thoughts to everyone at home are suspended by our astonishment of the wonderful spectacle which is exhibited in a neighboring and rival country. What spectators and what actors? England gazing with astonishment at the French struggle for liberty and not knowing whether to blame or to applaud. The thing indeed, though, I thought, I saw something like it in progress for several years as something of the paradoxical and mysterious. The spirit, it is impossible not to admire, but the old Parisian ferocity has broken out in a shocking manner. It is true that they may be no more than a sudden explosion, but if it should be character rather than accident, then that people are not fit for liberty and must have a strong hand like that of their former masters to coerce them. Men must have a certain fund of moderation, a certain fund of moderation to qualify them for freedom. Say it again, a certain fund for moderation to qualify them for freedom, else it becomes noxious to themselves and a perfect nuisance to everyone else. So the idea is, are they fit for this position? Are they, you know, the, the, the mob is getting a mind of its own. The fall of the Bastille signaled that, uh, that, that the National Constituent Assembly would not decide the political future of the nation, that there's got to be more that's involved, right? So news spread, uh, obviously. Uh, a few days later, old Louis, again, bowing to events. He, he arrived in Paris, and then you know what he did? Because uh, Paris is all a revolt, and he recognizes the newly elected government of Paris and its National Guard. And so the citizens of Paris, for the first time, became satisfied. So, you know, it's like, you know, so basically the rabble, <laughs> you know, creating this uh, streets and, you know, putting together these militias, the king is like going, okay, I guess I better recognize them. All right, you guys, you guys are in charge. There we go. Does that make me happy? Well, it doesn't. Uh, at first it does, but then there's a sudden fear. It's called the Great Fear that spreads across the French countryside. Peasants were reclaiming their rights and property. Uh, and, um, and so, because uh, the nobles had been gaining more and more power. And this Great Fear, what they did is, is what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to burn the chateaus. We're going to burn the castles. We're going to do everything we can, as they are thinking, to destroy records and documents, so that we don't uh, we don't ha- we don't, we don't have to owe anybody. You know, if we burn all the records, there there's there's no there's 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 no uh, no uh, documentation of what we owe. Then on the night of August fourth, seventeen eighty nine, the aristocrats in the National Constituent Assembly attempted to halt the disorder in the countryside. Uh, by prearrangement, the nobles and churchmen rose into the assembly and they surrendered all their hunting and fishing rights and their judicial authority, uh, special exemptions and their tithes. But you know what the reality is? They already had lost that. Uh, the, the peasants had already seized it by that time, but still it made them look good. <laughs> so, so they're declaring that you guys have it. But they are, but the peasants already took it. But hey, you know, it kind of smooths things over. But you're seeing that there's a lot going on between peasants uh, and nobles and the poor old king, <laughs> uh, Louis the Sixteenth. Then on August 27th, 1789, the assembly issued what's called the Declarations, Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. This declaration drew together much of the political language of the Enlightenment. Uh, it was also influenced by the Declaration of Rights adopted by Virginia in America in June of 1776. So this document on August 27th of 1789 is not following the Declaration of Independence or anything like that or uh, in, or the Constitution. It's following, obviously, it's following uh, the Virginia Constitution. So the United States is influential in this way. The French Declaration proclaimed that all men 
They're born and remain free and equal in rights. Their natural rights were liberty and property and security and resistance to oppression. In fact, the government existed to protect those rights. All political sovereignty resided in the nation and its representatives. All citizens were to be equal before the law and were to be equally admissible to all public uh, dignities, uh, offices, employment, according to their capacity and with no other distinction than their virtues and talents. So we know we're a meritolic, uh, a, a merit-based uh, system, right? All right, so, and of course, taxation was to be apportioned equally, but according to the capacity to pay. Pro property constituted an inviolable and sacred right. All right, so there you have it. So, hey, we got a, we got a, a, uh, a constitution. This is great, right? Good news, right? Uh, well, Louis, um, you know, um, he stalled before ratifying uh, both the Declaration and uh, the uh, aristocratic renunciation of feudalism, which he, by the way, already did earlier, but whatever. And because he hesitated, people became a little bit upset, uh, suspicious. Uh, there's something else that happened that people will talk about. I'll bring it up. On October 1st, uh, there was a banquet at Versailles. Um, it was uh, supposed to uh, welcome officers uh, of the newly arrived troops. They had this tradition where uh, when they, there's a change of garrison that the new, the, you know, the new troops arrived, the officers had a party, uh, but then they, they set up this big party at the upper house of the palace. This party went crazy. And people got drunk. Uh, it was uh, it was too lavish. And there's drunken officers. In fact, uh, there was a claim that some of those drunk officers tread on the tricolor uh, uh, cacao, which is, of course, a symbol of France. And so people are getting, so they're hearing that, you know, people are starving. Right now, uh, people are hungry uh, in the streets. And they're throwing a party in Versailles. So this triggers, of course, the famous October 5th Parisian March of Women upon Versailles, demanding more rent. So, so what? How did this occur? Okay, so basically, um, uh, this Women's March to Versailles. Uh, you know, uh, there happened to be, I'll tell you exactly how it started. You know, there's a young woman uh, that was beating the marching drum do, 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 next to a group of women who are complaining uh, in the marketplace about the price of bread. And so what happens is is that uh, uh, this uh, the anger starts to grow with the beating of this drum. It, this uh, conversation started to spread to the other markets on the east side of Paris. Uh, and uh, eventually it starts to grow. They, there's, a, there's a church in that region, and they make a, the church a toll their bells. And then so so now all of a sudden the women are upset. We need to do something. We need to feed our families. We need bread. And they emerge not only from the marketplaces, but they emerge from their homes uh, holding uh, 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 kitchen blades. <laughs> and whatever weapons they can find, they're angry. They, are, they go to the city hall. They demand bread uh, as well as arms. The, and then the city hall is, a, is attacked. Uh, then they estimate between about six to 10,000, six to 10,000 women then uh, start to march. There was a guy that was happened to be there. His name is Santelas Marie Mallard. Uh, he was very popular with women and uh, you know, he grabbed his own drum and he cried out to Versailles. <laughs> oh no. So it took about six hours to get to the palace. Uh, and they're calling, many of them were calling for the death of Marie Antoinette. Ooh, you know. By the way, Burke, uh, as if the English Burke writes, he says as follows: he says, the portentous stale of sorry, the portentous state of France where the elements which compose human society seem all to be dissolved and a world of monsters produced to take the place of it. So everything is becoming monstrous. And so now so this crowd arrives, the deputies of Versailles had no choice but to let them in. 
A few of the deputies, however, uh, welcomed them. It was, welcome, welcome. One of them was Maximilian Robespierre. Maximilian Robespierre, we'll hear his name eventually. Maximilian, Maximilian, the reign of terror, that Maximilian? Yeah, he appears now in history. Uh, he actually intervenes and calms down the crowd, and they like him for that. Oh, this is how he gets his start. And so six women are nominated by the crowd to see the king, and he and, and King Louis sees them, uh, and he says, yes, I will disperse funds, uh, and, um, <laughs> and yes, we'll go ahead and do this. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. You're going to have more bread, I promise you. So it starts to pour rain. Uh, some of the women leave, but some of the other women hang around and kind of wander through the garden. Many of them are saying that they think Marie Antoinette is going to change the mind of King uh, Louis and that he's going to retract and not give us the bread that we came here in the first place. So, uh, but he did follow through. But you can see again, there's this undercurrent. You see the resentment, you feel it. Okay, so what happens now? Uh, is uh, the Parisians now come to believe that the king had to be kept under a watchful eye of the people. So they demanded that Louis and his family return to Paris. The monarch had really no choice. So on October 6, 1789, his carriage followed the crowd into the city where they settled, settled at the Palace of the Tuileries. Uh, and, uh, and the National Constituent Assembly that was meeting in Versailles, they followed soon after. Okay. And thereafter, uh, I have to say that there seemed to be some relative peace and stability throughout the summer of 17, uh, to, to about the, you know, for a little while, for the summer. Now, once established, the National Constituent Assembly set about re reorganizing France. And so, so what they did is they, um, uh, while championing civic equality before the law, the assembly spurned social equality. And extensive democracy, uh, and um, and so um, there we have it. The National Constituent Assembly abolished the ancient provinces, the ancient French provinces, and they replaced them with eighty-three departments. The the assembly also established the metric system to provide the nation with a uniform weights and measures. So this is where this begins. The metric system starts here. Um, by the decrees of 1790. Assembly placed the burden of proof on the peasants to rid themselves of the residual feudal dues, which compensation was to be paid. Then on June 14, 1791, the Assembly enacted what is called the Capnier Act, forbidding worker associations, thereby crushing the attempt of urban workers to protect their wages. Well, there's still the exclusion of women. Uh, from both voting and holding office, and this is not passed by unnoticed. So, uh, so a certain Olympe de Gouge, Olympe, she was a butcher's daughter who became a major radical in Paris, and she was a famous playwright. And she thought, why can't women have rights too? And so she composed a Declaration of Rights of Women which she addressed to Marie Antoinette. Much of the document uh, repeated uh, the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, adding the word woman to various original classes. And so, but she further outlined rights that would permit women to own property and require men to recognize the paternity of their children. She called for the equality of the sexes in marriage and approved education for women, she declared, women, wake up. The whole set of reason is being heard throughout the whole universe. Discover your right. Her demands illustrate how, uh, the, how listing the public rights uh, of a man and citizen uh, could, uh, could be understood in different ways. Not just men, but women too. By the way, I want to bring up that she also spoke out against the slave trade uh, in the French colonies. And uh, she even put together as a playwright, she put together a play to address this issue. Um, but of course, the uh, slave trade lobbyists worked against her. Uh, and um, when she had this play going on, they even paid for hecklers. And so uh, as a result, 
the plant closed down after three weeks. But she tried to do her best, not only for equality for women, but for equality of all, including and, and the end of slavery. What a, that's pretty amazing. Well, the National Constituent Assembly now decided to pay that. Remember the debt? that we forgot about. Yeah, you still have that debt. We got to pay that off, you know? Yeah, the Seven-Year War, now, you know, that one, you know, the question before that. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of debts going on. So how are we going to pay this debt? The nobles are all, well, we're not going to pay it. The, you know, the, 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 the average people are going, well, we're not going to pay it. We got an idea. We'll get rid of the church. What? Yeah, we're going to get rid of the church. Wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, no, sort of get rid of it. Let's see what happens. And so what they did is they declared the lands of the Roman Catholic Church the property of France. And so they confiscated these lands, all of the lands of the Catholic Church, and sold these lands, and they, they, they converted them these into bonds. They liquidated all of this. And as a result of seizing the properties of the church, they were able to liquidate the, the majority of the national debt, which is within a few months. But although at a certain point, inflation started to increase uh, and putting stress, more stress on the urban poor. But yeah, so the answer to the question is, we'll just get rid of the church properties. Well, what are you going to do now with the church? I mean, they lost their property. So in July of 1790, the National Constitutional Assembly issued the Civil Constitution of the Clergy, the Civil Constitution of the Clergy, which transformed the Roman Catholic Church in France into a branch of the secular state. What? So it reduced the number of bishoprics, bishoprics uh, and it made it conform to the new departments. It provided for the election of priests and bishops, who henceforth became salaried employees of the state. So they're, they're, they're being paid by the state, uh, you know, and uh, they are disconnected. They're public, they're priests, but they're public employees. So, well, obviously, uh, this is going to cause a problem, right? The measure roused a lot of opposition of the French, uh, especially in the countryside. The cities are all, yay, but the country are like, wait a second. Uh, even those who champion uh, a revolution were kind of caught off guard. All clergy had to take an oath uh, to support the civil constitution. By the way, how many how many did for this? Only seven bishops and about half the clergy did so. In reprisal, the assembly designated the clergy who did not take the oath to be removed from their, their office, removed from their duty. Well, you know, the Pope is kind of going to know this, notice this, that, hey, you know, what happened to you guys? Uh, <laughs> uh, and so in February 1791, the Pope condemned not only the civil constitution of the clergy, but also the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. That condemnation was a big moment because it marked the beginning of the Catholic Church against anything that seemed to be liberalism or democratic and so it took the side of we're against revolutions we're against uh democracy you can see where we say this this will happen this will continue to happen um and be the stance of the church even all the way up to world war one yeah this is the beginning right there you know french citizens you know you know weren't sure what to do and so meanwhile in the summer of 1791, the queen and some nobles who had already left the country persuaded Louis, it's time for you to run away. We got to get away. We got to get out of here. So, so Louis tries to run away uh, with his family, and they're stopped at Laurent and, and uh, June 24th, and the soldiers then escort Louis back to Paris. Therefore, the National Constituent Assembly knew that their that the king was not supportive of them. Two months later, in August 27, 1791, King Leopold of Austria, who was the brother of Marie Antoinette, and Frederick William II, the King of Prussia, issued the Declaration of Pilnitz, and they promised to intervene in France to protect the royal family and preserve the monarchy 
of the other European powers. But unfortunately, Great Britain didn't join in this, but hey, here we go. Well, we're thinking, okay. Now, in France, however, uh, uh, they're thinking, you know what? We need, why not? We need another assembly. We do? Yeah. We, you know, this assembly, it made the Constitution. Okay. But now we got to have another assembly, another one, another assembly uh, to, uh, uh, to confront the more, more immense problems that of after this Constitution. It's like, that's really complicated. I know. So they call themselves the Legislative Assembly. I told you it's like a nightmare of bureaucracy. And this new body met on October 1st. Uh, so here we have it. So now this this legislative assembly uh, uh, is uh, uh, basically if you are part of the National Constitutive Assembly, you could not be elected into this assembly. It's all new, and um, it was of course um, organized. Uh, the best uh, those who organized it were known as the Jacobins. Uh, the name is derived from a group of who met in a former Dominican or Jacobin monastery, the Rue Saint-Jacques. This Paris club was linked to other clubs and so forth. And the, the, this, the, the Jacobins and the Legislative Assembly, uh, there are basically split into three different factions. And you've got to know these factions. You've got to know this. I'm sorry. This, so these are the factions. You have the Gerardists. You have the saint -Colais. And you have the mountain. I said again, you have the Derrinists, San Colet, and the mountain. And what will happen is the first part of the French Revolution, the Derrinists will be in charge. The second will be the San Colet, and the third, the mountain. Got it? So that's how it works. That's the three sections of this revolution starting right here. And it's all in this legislative assembly. So what do they do? What is the first thing they do? This is crazy. This is really crazy. So these these are uh, the Gerardists, or the Girondists, right? Uh, for the Department of Gironde. They assume the leadership in the beginning. So they're the first leaders of this legislative assembly. And what do they do? Well, on April 20th, 1792, they declare war on Austria. Because, you know, they had this little agreement that we talked about. Remember the Declaration of Hildmitz? Well, you know, who's involved in that? Well, Leopold of Austria. So they're against us. So we're against them. So we're going to declare war on Austria. Kind of preemptive. By, of course, this time governed by Francis uh, II, who, of course, is allied with Prussia. Now, the war with Austria radicalized the revolution and led to what's called the Second Revolution which eventually, of course, overthrew the constitutional monarchy and established the Republic of France. The war, as you can understand, went poorly, and the revolutionaries uh, seemed to be in danger. But late in July, under radical working class pressure, the government of Paris passed from the elected council to a committee or a commune of representatives uh, and, uh, and, of course, municipal wards of Paris. Then, on August 10th, 1792, a large crowd invaded the Tuileries and forced Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette to take refuge in the Legislative Assembly itself. Uh, now, of course, eventually Louis is officially arrested on August 13th, 1792. He's sent to a place called the Temple. Uh, this is an ancient fortress. It was actually initially built by the Knights Templar, why it's called the Temple. It had these really, uh, really vertical uh, lines, these sharp, uh, uh, scary-looking uh, towers. Uh, he, was, he was put here in prison, uh, and um, there he stayed. Uh, during the first week of September, occurred what's called the September Massacres. And this Paris commune that I mentioned that was just recently formed, killed about 1,200 people uh, in the city jails. You gotta, you gotta clear the jails so we just simply kill the people in them. Many were aristocrats or priests, sure, but uh, a lot of them were also common criminals. Uh, the Paris Commune then compelled the Legislative Assembly to 
call for the election by, by universal manhood suffrage of a new assembly uh, to write a democratic constitution. Oh, great. So now we're going to have, no, no, stop, Dr. Riefeld, no, another assembly? Yeah, it's called the convention. <laughs> which is named after the American uh, counterpart in 1787. Uh, this was, of course, met September 21st, 1792. And the first act, of course, to declare France as a republic and that it is a nation governed by an elected assembly without a king. Now, at this point, the revolution becomes more radical. It's going to get worse. It's building up. So the Jaredists were, of course, part of the first, but now the people known as the San Cole. This next faction takes over. Uh, what, is this? What, is this? what does that mean? It means without breeches. It was derived from the long trousers that as working people, uh, they, they wore instead of the aristocratic uh, knee breeches, right? The San Cole were shopkeepers, they're artisans, the wage earners, factory workers, right? So now we're moving from Girondists, which are more of the, uh, the nobles. Now it's moving more to uh, the middle class, lower middle class. They're kind of taking it over. And they're upset because they feel like they're victims of the unregulated uh, economic markets. The saint uh, they were the laborers. They were the folks who are fighting the war. They're the soldiers. Uh, and uh, they knew what they wanted. They sought immediate price controls for relief from food shortages and rising prices. And they felt, of course, a, a really a strong hatred for aristocracy. Well, now, meanwhile, poor Louis, uh, you know, um, what happens is he's trying to cooperate with these individuals. Uh, but uh, uh, what will happen is, is that uh, as the San Colais gain more power, there is a third power that starts to move. It's called the mountain. Now, the mountain, uh, they're named that because they had they, the assembly, they sat on the highest level of the seats. Those are the ones to watch out. So they're watching the Gerondas, they're watching the San Colais, they're watching them fight back and forth for power, and the Gerondas are losing power. The San Colais rising up, and the mountain is watching to see which side they're going to ally themselves with. They're the ones. They're the quiet. We've got to watch out for the quiet ones. They're the ones who have And they're waiting. They're watching. Right? So uh, what happens is on December in 1792, uh, Louis was put on trial as the citizen cafe. Or cafe, I should say, right? Gerald uh, Moss who are more noble in background, they sought to spare his life. The San Cole are not sure what to do. Now the mountain rises. And the mountain rises to defeat the effort. By a narrow majority, Louis was convicted of conspiring against the liberty of the people and the security of the state. He was condemned to death and he was to be beheaded on January 21st, 1793, he was 38 years old. He when just before uh, they cut off his head, uh, he he basically uh, uh, he, he pardoned those who were the cause of his death. That's actually a quote. He declared himself innocent, but they cut his head off. His body was thrown into a mass grave at the Madeleine Cemetery. Uh, some of the onlookers. Uh, uh, took uh, handkerchiefs and they dipped uh, their handkerchiefs in the blood that dripped from his severed head. And uh, one of these has been found. And in 2012, they did a DNA test on it and it really was Louis's blood. Yeah, so there we go. So, so now they killed their king. Well, after executing the king, the convention now declared war on Great Britain but they're already at war with Austria, and they're already at war with Prussia. I know. They're declaring war against Great Britain? Yeah. They also declare against war against Holland, and they declare war against Spain. Now, why would you do that? That's crazy. Hey, they're, they're, they're fighting Spain in the south. Hey, you follow this. They're fighting Holland to the north. 
They're following. They're fighting Britain to to the west. They're fighting Prussia to the east. They're fighting Austria. Uh, you know, uh, from the, from the from the southeast. What is, what's going on? You guys are crazy. Why would you declare war on everybody? This is called radicalization. This is called not clear thinking. They they didn't have to do this, but they did. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, meanwhile. Uh, you know, you're going to have uh, the Jaredists um, uh, were proved to be incapable of leading the country. The mountain stood ready for the task. And so now the mountain moved as far as the mountain moved. Uh, and so begins the reign of terror. You know, uh, this, of course, stretches from the autumn of 1793 to the midsummer of 1794. Uh, now, uh, during this period of time, uh, the Jaredists are crushed. The San Colais gained more power as supported by the mountain. Uh, so what will happen is during this period, there will be 300,000 arrests, 17,000 executions, and 10,000 um, either died in prison or something happened to them. This is anarchy. And who is orchestrating this? The convention established what's called Committee of Public Safety. What an interesting name. A Committee of Public Safety? Yeah. <laughs> They're the ones doing this? Yeah. So uh, the committee conceived of their task as saving the revolution from mortal enemies at home and abroad. You know, and so, uh, yeah. And so, um, meanwhile, in 1793, June, I should say, the Parisian Saint Calais invaded the convention and secured the expulsion of the Derendus members, and that gave the mountain complete control. Right. Then, on June 22nd, the convention approved a fully democratic convent, uh, constitution. Oh, that's good. Hey, there we go. We finally got a fully democratic constitution. But it's suspended. W why is it suspended? Because they're at war. Oh, yeah, war with who? Again? Austria, Prussia, Holland, England, Spain. Oh, this is insane for world history. Seriously, this is nuts. It's crazy, right? All right, so uh, so we can't. And we have a constitution, but we can't because you know it's it's a war, right? Good excuse. And so, meanwhile, they they start to levy. Uh, general military uh, uh, requisition of the populace because, you know, taking all these these men for the army. Uh, and so then they, they do establish a maximum for prices as well. Meanwhile, revolutionary women, they, they establish their own distinct institutions to fight the internal enemies of the revolution. We don't want to be involved in this. On May of 1793, Pauline Leon and Claire Lebeau Founded the Society of Revolutionary Republican Women, uh, and so they 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 filled the upper galleries of the convention, and these members sought stricter controls on the price of food and other commodities, uh, and they and they how do they do this? Well, they're up in the upper areas and balcony areas, and they're shouting down what they want, and they do uh, change some policy, but indirectly, but by October seventeen ninety three. The Jacobins in the convention had begun to fear turmoil uh, of that, that the women were causing. And so they banned all women's clubs and societies. Uh, and so women were repressed in 1793. Uh, Olympe de Gauget, uh, we talked about her. She was guillotined on November 1793. So now the persecution is going against the women. By the way, and the women were the early part of the movement. Hello, right? We talked about this earlier. Remember the, the bread shortage going to Versailles? Now all of a sudden it's like, no, no, no. We're, they're just they're discounted. Wow, this is awful. Yeah, it gets worse. It can't get worse than this. It's going to get worse. Well, what happens now is a committee of public safety starts making these lists. It gets really scary, right? Uh, they have a tribunal. Uh, <laughs> and they start to gain more power. So, you know, and they, they, they said, you know what? Um, in October, actually September 5th, 
they, this is, I'm serious. On September 5th, the vote of the convention, they agree that, quote, terror is the order of the day. What? Unquote. So, and they're allowed to now create revolutionary armies to force compliance to the state. On September 17th, they have, they issue out what's called the law of suspects. It, it passes. What's the law of suspects? Well, basically, it enables them to arrest anybody without much of a trial uh, for anything. In fact, I'll read the wording here. Uh, those who, uh, either by their conduct or their relations, or by their words or writings, have shown themselves to be partisans of tyranny or of federalism and enemies of freedom, they can be arrested. That's it. So it's any one of those areas. So that means even if you're related to somebody, you could be arrested and thrown in the clink without a trial in many cases. Now, September 29th, uh, they fix wages, more wages, more than just bread, bread and grain, uh, but also fix the prices, uh, like I said, of wages and essentials, goods, and so forth. Uh, during this period of time, uh, they decided, you know, I think Christianity should end. So let's de-Christianize everything. So they now close the churches. Uh, they persecuted the clergy and believers. They forced priests to marry. Wow. Uh, next arrived the outline of public and private worship and religious education. The enactment of a law on October 21st. 1793 made all suspected priests and all persons who harbored them liable to death on sight. They were to be executed. And meanwhile, a person rises from the mountain in the midst of all this from the Committee of Public Safety, and his name is Maximilian Rovesphere. Yes, there it is. Yes, and so he is a shrewd politician uh and uh so and of course he got the support of the San Cole, right he continued to dress uh just like everybody else uh meanwhile during this time they declared what is called the cult of reason what's the cult of reason yes so what happens is this, uh, um, in November 1793, the convention decreed the Theater of Notre Dame to be the Temple of Reason. Uh, in celebration of the Goddess Reason now became institutionalized. The cult of reason was celebrated in a carnival-like atmosphere to replace that of Christianity. Meanwhile, there's a ransacking of churches and uh, icon iconoclasm and, and everything else. Oh, the great monastery of Cluny, I want to mention. Cluny was a famous monastery. It was the world's largest church until St. Peter's was built. And it was started 19, sorry, it started 910. Well, during this period of time, uh, the revolution not only closes down the churches, but in the case of this structure, they uh, uh, they, they tear it down. They only leave one little, little, one little piece behind. It's just so funny because I have a picture of it. This is the piece that left behind. I was always fascinated by it. Uh, this is mine. I drew this. So this is mine. Yeah, this is my drawing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the, the left, the last part of the largest, the second largest church. It was the largest church in, in Western Europe. And they, all they left is this as a monumental tombstone. There we go. Yeah. Voila. <laughs> okay. So you can see I was kind of into that, right? So... What is this cult of reason? Well, um, the idea is perfection of humanity through the attainment of truth and liberty. Basically, it's a state-sponsored atheistic religion. Uh, and today, uh, Francois Mamora uh, was one of the founders. He talked about, this is a quote, it says, liberty, reason, truth are the only abstract beings. They are not gods. For properly speaking, they are part of ourselves. It's a civic religion that was inspired by Rousseau, uh, the famous thinker from 1712 to 1778. Uh, he believed that uncorrupted morals win out 
in a state of nature. In fact, his famous quote was as follows. He says, so the idea is we're returning to reason, which is naturally there within nature. You know, now this is, there's an irony. So, they, they, so basically they're destroying the church. They're persecuting the church. They're killing priests. Uh, they're demolishing things. And there's, and they, they, and they replace this church. They're, they have this cult of reason. And a lot of the ideas are based on Rousseau. Now, listen to this quote by Rousseau, because you can see where it really doesn't quite fit. Rousseau says as, as follows. He says, the first man who, having fenced in a piece of land, said, this is mine, and found people naive enough to believe him. That man is the true founder of civil society. From how many crimes, wars, and murders, from how many horrors and misfortunes might not anyone have saved mankind? By pulling up stakes or filling up the ditch and crying to his fellow, beware of listening to this imposter. You are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself to nobody. Okay, so it kind of seems to be you know, it's all get along kind of thing. But, uh, but, but the, the irony is that these people are are doing they're, they're basically doing. Uh, all the horrors and misfortunes uh, and murders in order to create the society that's idyllic. <laughs> Many have drawn parallels with this concept, this idea with Marxism, the utopian ideas of Marxism. Uh, there's a few books that talk about this. Um, I have um, a very famous one right here that talks about the connections between the two. So, so there's some. So the so there we go. So. Where do we go from here? Well, we got a mess. Robosphere is rising up. Now, this guy, I know we're going over, but we, we, we need to finish this up. We'll get there. We're almost, we're getting close. So, don't worry. First of all, Robosphere, Max Millian, what's he like? First of all, he has no sense of humor. None. He's not really self aware, he's very puritanical. Uh, he believes so much in his self-righteousness. He believed that he was always right. And if anybody contradicted him, they were wrong. He was right. And if they refused to recognize that he was wrong, I mean, recognize that he was right, excuse me, refused to recognize that he was right, then what he would do is that he would try to undermine who they are, their authority, and would go on a campaign of, of hate speech and other kinds of media uh, manipulation to undermine this person. He just makes stuff up, right? Because he was always right. So he cast doubt on others. Uh, he could he had no sense of sympathy whatsoever. And he ultimately believed the connection between his followers. He believed that law equals morality. Morality equals justice. And justice equalness equals goodness. Therefore, law equals goodness. Goodness equals law. And he boasted himself as the best arbitrator. Uh, and he was not a paranoid individual, but he took advantage of those who are paranoid. And he gained and raised his power. Well, um, his speeches were exceptional. Uh, he had the power to change the views of almost any audience. Uh, in fact, uh, he talked about, you know, how he's going to return France to its, 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 its virtues and its morals, uh, and we're going to go back uh, and be good people again. He believed, though, that the terror was a time of discovery. They recognized the word terror, by the way. They called it the terror. I just told you the legislative day they declared it the terror. Yeah, they called it terror. And terror, from his mindset, was good. It was good. So he so so he believed. He said that there are enemies within Paris. There are enemies within France. And the enemies hid behind the safety of apparent patriotism. But he said no. And so he said as follows. He told the convention. He said, now listen closely. And you're going to hear madness. You ready? I'm going to quote him. If the mainspring of popular government in peacetime 
is virtue. Amen. Revolution, it is at the same time virtue and terror. Virtue without which terror is fatal. Terror without which virtue is impotent. Terror is nothing but prop, severe, inflexible injustice. It is therefore an emanation of virtue. <laughs> He's crazy. Yeah, he is. Uh, Robespierre expanded the traditional list of revolutionary enemies. He says, you know what? We need to watch out for those who are claiming to be moderate. If they're not on our side, if they claim to be in the middle, they're on their side. They're on the opposite side. These are, these are false revolutionaries. They're disguised. Watch out because they're amongst us, these, these false revolutionaries. And so he is, the decrees of the committee hunted down these people. Uh, of course, his policy led to the execution of many of the revolution's original and most staunch advocates. But uh, hey, he had no mercy on those. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, throughout uh, is what's called the Report of the Principles of Political Morality. Robespierre uh, uh, basically uh, attacked on all fronts. He built up suspicion. Uh, his reign in terror, of course, manifested through a series of revolutionary tribunals that were established by the convention during the summer of 1793. Uh, they were to try the enemies of the Republic. And of course, their first victim was, yeah, yeah, Marie Antoinette, Stein Vertigo, and other members of the royal family and aristocrats. You know, and so they were executed in October of 1793. Followed by, guess what? Remember the Durandists? Remember they're the part? Yeah, guess what? Now they're being executed. But they were part of the, but wait, wait, no, oh, no. Yeah, so, so, so the tribunal condemned thousands of people to death by the guillotine, which is considered so, you know, nice and neat, right? So then, during the winter of 1794, Rolandsphere turned the terror against Republican political figures of both left and right. Remember the Song Calais? Remember them? You know, they kind of went along with this. Now he starts turning against the Song Calais. Whoa, well, well, now we're losing them. Okay, so you see, this is a mess. This is the reign of terror. And uh, he secured uh, a passage of law that permitted the revolutionary tribunals to convict suspects without hearing substantial evidence. A secured uh, in 1794, March 24th, the execution of extreme saint leaders. It's happening. And now everybody's paranoid. Who's going to turn against next? They're not sure. So he did a huge mistake. He made a speech in the convention and he says, okay, there's, there's a conspiracy. There's a conspiracy amongst the leaders of this government against me. They're in the very halls of this convention. And we're going to find out who they are, because I know who they are. Now, you can see the crowd going, who is it? Is it, you know, <laughs> is it us? You know, you just, you executed the Darrenists, uh, you yeah. You know, you're executed now the San Jose. Of course, you, the nobles are, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's more of us. Maybe it's even the mountain. I mean, <laughs> who's going to be? So they're wondering. They don't even know who it is. They're so confused. So what are we going to do? Uh, so, uh, so can you name the people? He should have named the people. Uh, so on July 27th, which is the ninth uh, Thermidor, members of the convention, by prearrangement, shouted him down when he rose to speak. It's like, no, we're enough. You've done enough. Robespierre was arrested that night. Um, yeah, it's over, right? The reign of terror is over. He, he tried to kill himself with a pistol, but he missed. Although he managed to shatter his jaw, but he missed as far as the killing point. So what they did uh, is that they, uh, his broken jaw what they did is they wrapped his broken jaw around really tight with bandages. It's time for him to be guillotined on the next day. 
And so what they did is they put his head right there, ready for the guillotine to go down. And at the last minute, they tore off that bandage and they heard this, ah! And his head was cut off mid screen. And that was the end of Maximilian and the reign of terror. <laughs> as I said, we had all these victims uh, as a result of this horrendous, the revolution definitely went wrong, right? <laughs> Again, 300. 1,000 arrested, 17,000 executed, uh, 10,000 died in prison. Although some some will say that they're as high as 40,000 victims. So, but there you have it. But now we have a tempering revolution. It's called the uh, Thermidorian Reaction, which began in July of 1794. And what it did is it systematically destroy the machinery of terror and set up a new, yes, a new constitutional regime. <laughs> now, now, who's going to be in charge now? Well, the, uh, basically, it will be the generally wealthy middle class and professional people. We place that in Saint Calais. Saint Calais, who are the lower middle class, now they're being replaced by the upper middle class, but not the wealthy because they got rid of that with the terrorists. <laughs> so there you have it. The people responsible for the terror were removed from public life, uh, and the Paris Jacobin Club was closed. Uh, the Thermodian Revolution, a reaction, issued, guess what? Yes, another constitution, because we need another one, uh, in, in 1793. And this one, because the revolution went so crazy one way, it went the other way. It became more conservative. Well, um, uh, I think we've got to end the war. <laughs> so, um, so the Treaty of Basel in March of 1795, uh, concluded the peace uh, with Prussia and Spain, and slowly but surely, uh, they're stopping all their wars, everybody, which, which is good. Uh, the Th Thermidorians repealed the ceiling on prices, although the food riots resulted uh, during the, uh, the winters of 1794-1795 uh, proved to be a, a terrible time. Uh, then, of course, there are, hey, guess what? Revolts in the streets, because, hey, you know, it's, we need bread, we need but the Thermidorians are not going to put up with this. You know, they're tired of revolutionaries. They're tired of the people marching on the streets. They're just tired altogether. And so when Paris is revolting again, right? You know, during this winter with these food riots, they're all well, going to take care of this. And so for the first time in history, the artillery was turned against the people of Paris. There's a general uh, by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte who commanded the cannon. And, um, and of course, you see he now, it, and he's going to be putting down uh, this rabble, which before was taken seriously, and now uh, learning the lessons, or not good lessons, uh, is being put down. So Napoleon now rises up. I'll, I'll be brief on Napoleon because we're, we're getting towards the end, right, of this revolution. Okay, so Napoleon, um, uh, he, he uh, uh, you know, it's unfortunately uh, uh, what happened with him uh, in 1793. Of course, he had played a leading role in recovering uh, part of Tulum for the British. Uh, he was rewarded by becoming a brigadier general. Uh, then, of course, uh, he uh, basically took uh, Italy out of the war, he took Austria out of the war, and he took Switzerland out of the war. Good news. So I mean, so he's kind of taking care of those problems. Uh, in November of 1797, the triumph of Bonaparte returned to Paris to be hailed as hero and to confront uh, France's only remaining enemy, Britain. And of course, uh, he judged it too impossible to attack Britain. So what did he do? Because he can't cross the English Channel. That's too difficult. And so uh, he just decided to establish a French presence in the, in the Middle East. And so he's going to go ahead uh, and attack, well, <laughs> uh, British e uh, Egypt. Uh, that will be the way, uh, believing that he's going to have some kind of a deal uh, there. Bonaparte, uh, his troops reach Malta, uh, take out the Knights Templar. 
and then they invade Egypt. But that was a kind of a failure with uh, obviously uh, Admiral Nelson uh, defeated the French fleet. And so the troops are kind of stuck in Egypt. He kind of leaves them. I know. He just leaves them there. Uh, then the Russians, the Austrians, the Ottomans join the British to form another coalition, the second coalition. And so then, here it is. On November 10th, 1799, his troops overthrew the directory and Bonaparte issued the constitution. Wait, another constitution? Another constitution? On December 1799, establishing himself as first consul. Oh no! And so becomes the consulate. From 1799 to 1804, uh, quickly, of course, um, he wanted to achieve peace with the enemies of, of, above and beyond. Uh, and so Napoleon rises to power. Oh, now we have some other issues we have to take care of. We've got to wrap it up. To so put apart, restore peace and order at home. He used, of course, flattery and generosity. He bribed. He also had a secret police system to suppress any kind of political opposition. Napoleon uh, had to deal with the church. Remember the church? Yeah, you remember the French Revolution kind of got rid of the church? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we got to bring it back, right? So we got we have to address that issue. So Napoleon, he met with Pope Pius the, the, uh, the, uh, the seventh, and uh, he declared the Roman Catholic Church as the religion of the great majority of French citizens. Okay. There, uh, so there you have it. Um, and so, but uh, the church had to agree by that recognition to give up its claim to any confiscated property that happened over the course of the revolution. Uh, but at the same time, uh, still, uh, and also, by the way, state uh, were still in charge of naming the bishops and they paid their salaries. Uh, so there you have it. So you still had that secularization aspect, but we're kind of back. We're kind of back. Uh, by 1802, uh, he's declared um, um, also for life. I want to mention this, though. Uh, he also reestablished and allowed Protestants to be around. And he was also good to Jewish communities. I'm going to bring that. He was really good to the Jewish communities. And they felt very much empowered during his reign. That would be an important issue that I do want to bring up a little bit. He did issue the Napoleonic Code. Um, of 1804, but the problem is it's very conservative. Um, uh, it, um, the fathers were granted extensive control over their children and men over their wives. Labor unions were still forbidden. Uh, and so, you know, so there you have it. Uh, somebody tried to kill Napoleon in 1804. Well, I guess it's time to change the government again. Again? Yeah. So I'm no longer consul. I'm an emperor. So in 1804, he's declared emperor, and is now we have the empire, the Napoleonic Empire. Oh boy. And then he meets to the Pope, and they agree that Napoleon should crown himself. <laughs> so before the Pope, Napoleon crowns himself as emperor. That way he doesn't owe anything to the papacy, but still, the papacy, uh, you know, is still agreeing to we'll work with it. At least they're not slaughtering everybody like the earlier French Revolution. We like that. Uh, uh, for, for a short period of time, Napoleon makes an agreement with Britain, uh, the Treaty of Amiens, uh, but it doesn't last very long. And 1803, it starts up again. And then we got the various wars. Everybody kind of gets involved in that, which we won't talk about. That's a whole other topic. I'll just say that uh, uh, Napoleon. He does try to invade, because uh, Russia was at first for him, then against it, then you had the continental system, yada, yada. But eventually, it's over. He meets his Waterloo. And uh, there you have it. What do they do? They establish a king again. <laughs> so, so, uh, so it's a mess. Uh, and after everything is over, you have what's called the Congress of Vienna. This is where I close. This is my last caveat here. Congress of Vienna meets because uh, because Napoleon, through during this period of time, for a short period of time, he was able to basically take the majority of Europe. It was under Napoleon. I mean, he had it all, but he pressed his luck a little bit too much, went a little bit too far. Uh, and now uh, that Napoleon was defeated, now you gotta have to divvy it up. Of course, he was defeated in 1814 and defeated. 
He, then he got out and said, from St. Helena's. And, wait, 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 wait. So, so what happens now is the Congress of Vienna. And what they do is they establish a new Europe. I want to close with there. So what's a new Europe? They established the Kingdom of the Netherlands, including Belgium in the north. Uh, Prussia, whose power was increased by the acquisition of, acquisition of Eastern Europe, was given important new territories in the west. So as a result of this, Prussia starts to grow in size. Prussia starts taking over those little German principalities and is officially recognized by the Congress of Vienna. And so it looks like it's the beginning of Prussia growing into what will become eventually Germany. It starts right here. Not only that, because in fact, uh, uh, they're allowed to expand even to the Rhine because they want to fight, a, you know, have some kind of uh, defense against any French aggression. So you can see, it's like, meanwhile, Austria was given full control of Northern Italy for a period of time, but Austria becomes powerful again on its own. Uh, I do want to mention that the Holy Roman Empire was destroyed, ended by Napoleon, who was not resurrected. So it never came back. Eastern Europe was also divided up. All right, uh, he escaped from Elba, as mentioned, Napoleon escaped from Elba, and then he ends up in St. Helena's. But again, we got the Waterloo story. But we're going to close it up. So what happens now? What's the reaction? Well, the initial reaction to this mess that's called the French Revolution is that it went too far. And so there's a distrust of democracy. There's a distrust of liberalism. And they felt that uh, they need to follow tradition, that we need to follow a, a, a monarchy through inheritance. And so for a period of time, after this, the reality is, is, is the kings of, of, of Europe gain power again. So we go backwards. Uh, strong and privileged landowning aristocracy also gain power again. The official church, the Catholic church, also gains power again. Because now, uh, because of the mess of the revolution, those who even propose, propose these ideas are looked at as dangerous radicals because the French Revolution becomes a lesson of what we don't want to do. That mob rule did happen, that the people don't know what they're talking about. And they kind of ignore what happened with the American Revolution. Well, that's the American Revolution. This is different. This has happened here on our own continent. And they're against these alternative ideologies, liberalism. They look down, you know. Uh, you know, however, liberty and equality, they were not completely defeated in 1815. You know, so so individual freedoms were recognized more. So even though kings did gain some powers, and the church did gain some powers, and the nobles gained powers again, which seems to undo a lot of things in France too, still there's a few things that leak through. And somebody asked this question at the beginning of this lecture. So I'm going to give you that answer. The idea of more individual rights, even under uh, a monarchy, was encouraged. The second thing is freedom of the press. Free press now becomes, even within, in many cases, even within uh, um, a monarchical system, freedom of the press is permitted. Freedom of speech is will become more permitted. Freedom of assembly. Uh, is is permitted and freedom of arbitrary arrest. Ooh, our freedom of our arbitrary arrest. Now you know where that came from, <laughs> right? The French Revolution, the tribunal, right? You know, Rubens here, right? Makes sense. So there were some lessons that we gained out of this. They were, right? Of course, um, uh, France was now under uh, uh, Louis the Eighteenth, uh, but uh, so, so liberalism. Uh, you know, it only succeeded in that way. Of course, the other thing I want to bring up is uh, there was more freedom when it comes to the marketplace. That was another result. Uh, so uh, what will happen is the laissez-faire idea 
of economic ideas that were proposed by Adam Smith and others. That comes about, you know. So basically, uh, uh, the the belief that there we need to have free competition, and that the invisible hand of the self-regulated market uh, should be given to all citizens, and it, it results in fair and equal opportunity for those who do their best. So it does bring up uh, a strong uh, support of capitalistic ideas, right? But also, uh, you do get some qualified right to vote that does come about in some cases, in some places. But it was still limited to uh, aristocratic landowners, uh, business uh, men, and successful members of various professions. Uh, the lower middle class, for in many of these places, were de still. Uh, they didn't say they didn't own property. They, they couldn't vote. So, so you have some limited voting that comes about. Although you had this existing before, hello, you know, uh, England, a few other places, but it's still it's becoming more spread out throughout the rest of Europe. So these things existed before, but by after 1815, um, this comes about, and, and there's there's a French Revolution aspect here. But one thing that comes out of the treaty, sorry, of the the, 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 the Congress of Vienna. Um, that I want to bring up. Oh, here's a fun fact. You know, uh, when uh, the convention met, those who were on the sitting on the left side were more liberal, and those who were sitting on the right side were more conservative, and that's where we get the idea of the left and the right. Uh, that is the convention uh, at Vienna. Something else came out of this. And uh, even though uh, it has nothing to do with the French Revolution, it still had to do with results because Napoleon had, had broken through, took over these territories. And the question is, how do we redefine Europe? How do we cut it back up again? Because uh, he destroyed everything. How do we reestablish it? And so what happens is uh, the idea is, well, the concept is, is that if you speak the same language, if you have uh, the same background in culture, as well as belief, then you should be your own country. And that's an idea that starts to rise after 1815. And this, of course, is nationalism. So you have a common language, you have a common history, and you are in the same territory you should be in charge. And so you're gonna see where this happens gradually in Eastern Europe, slowly, little by little. But the French Revolution did start a lot. There were some good legacies and I just brought it up so you do know, but so much of it was also a lesson of what not to do. And for a long time, it was used to uh, uh, to be suspicious of what the people want, because look what happened. So many people died. It was, you know, and so the idea itself of this terror went into people's minds. Now, I want to bring up one last thing. And you're thinking, what happened? You said, Dr. Riefeld, you said that the Jews were suddenly, um, were, were treated very well by Napoleon, right? Yeah. So in his territories, uh, anti-Semitism went down. He believed that the Jews, as well as everybody else, should be part of, of, of his new ideal vision. You know, but here's the problem. Of course, Napoleon lost. And many people viewed that the Jews were working, this is terrible. The Jews were working with Napoleon, because, you know, because he gave them many favors. That's because he wanted to right the wrongs of anti-Semitism that had spread throughout Europe since, uh, for, since the 300s, right? But now, there's another legacy. After 1815, I have a book here. It's very old. Uh, it's written by Lady Morgan, 
1821. And she went to Italy. Uh, she had observed these events. And she went to Italy after it was, remember, uh, Northern Italy was taken over by the French. During that time, uh, you know, those who were Jewish, you know, uh, thrived under, uh, under Napoleon. But now the English took over. They took over parts of Northern Italy. Yeah, right after the war, they took over. And what did they do? I have a primary source says what they do. This is very rare, but I have it. And I'm going to read what they did. This is a good way to close because this will lead to other perspectives. Here it is. On page 21. But, she says, in this deep tragedy, there is an episode which the truth of history demands to be told and from which British humanity, so humanity will turn revolting. The town of Arizzo had been long noted for the bigotry and altruism of its inhabitants, and materials were supported to exist there more than in any other city of Tuscany for forwarding a reaction. A Madonna was made to perform a miracle to raise the populace against what was called the Revolutionary Party. The most ferocious of the ignorant population mounted a leaden Madonna in their hats, seized their arms, and drunk with wine and fanaticism, proceeded with most sanguinary designs to Florence. Their leader was Mr. Winham, the British minister. He rode at the head of his imperial mob, his frail but beautiful mistress on his right, dressed and mounted as an Amazon, on his left a monk with a crucifix in one hand and a pistol in the other. Countrymen of Milton, of Newton, of Locke, it is thus your glorious name and honorable wealth have been prosecuted at various epochs to aid the cause of oppression and of bigotry. It is thus that while you have been instigated to persecute your Catholic brethren at home, your agents have been made instrumental abroad in reviving and upholding an abject mummery and a barbarous fanaticism, which, however beneficial to the corrupt interests of temporal dominion, are despised and executed by the sincere of all religions. And it goes, it says, ultra, and it goes on, it says, nothing, because it is, that has been revealed or recited of the horrors of the counter uh, a revolution in France or under the reign of terror, approach the deeds of blood executed in the horrible interval of this reaction in Tuscany. What did the British do? At Siena, 17 persons, principally Jews, were burnt alive. An infant at the breast shared the same fate with its wretched mother, while the Cardinal Archbishop of Siena remained tranquilly in his palace like him at Arezzo, to bless the fury of the populace and the zeal of the Protestant English minister and to return thanks to heaven that in spite of the heresy and the philosophy of the age, one Jew more was roasted to the honor and glory of God and goes on and on and on. And you have the resurgence in Europe of anti-Semitism. That's another legacy that follows 1815. Because the French allied themselves with the Jewish communities, now there's a backlash against these communities, taking these rights away. And this will continue to build throughout Europe again. It's a resurgence, and you can see it build into the 20th century and ultimately, of course, uh, uh, into World War II, right? Hitler and so forth. I mean, so this is another legacy. And hey, you know what? You're, this is a real primary source that you're looking at. Wow. Have we learned a lot tonight? Has this been interesting? So there you have it. Uh, I, I, we didn't go over all the French Revolution. <laughs> I actually taught an entire course on the French Revolution. That was the first class I ever taught uh, at Out State Dominguez Hills in 2005. They're like, you're teaching the French Revolution. Okay. 
<laughs> so I think I put as much as I could uh, in this short period of time, which is, of course is quite long. I think I've been going on uh, for two hours and 20 minutes, but I think you have at least a rough idea of the French Revolution and you see uh, its legacy uh, even today. Thank you so much. Well, that was an impossible task. <laughs> but to, I didn't know about the wars that drove up the French debt as a, a driver of the revolution and the tie between Napoleon and anti-Semitism or the rise of anti-Semitism as Again. a backlash. Brand yeah. new information. My brain is just exploding. Yeah, I mean, it was bad in Europe before. Napoleon tried to alleviate it. And after his power, it just made it worse. Yeah. Now they had an excuse. Uh, Dorian, Dorian, is there a story behind lesbian being referred to as the German vice? Yeah, well, of course, I'll, I'll, the French don't like Germans, the Germans don't like French. And it's just one of those things where the Germans were looked at as, um, um, okay, I'm going to be very careful here. The Germans were looked at as, 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 as deviants. Uh, and you see that in the Berlin culture. Uh, does that make sense? You know, that, that comes about during even, uh, but uh, it's not true. I'm just saying that was, the, that's the French for you. So it's like, that's, you know, this is obviously, um, you know, you have people who are lesbian in France, but that was a term that they used at the time. They used this in their pamphlets. So, you know, uh, was, uh, was she, was she a lesbian? And the answer is, we don't know. We don't know. There doesn't seem to be any evidence directly of it. We do know that she was very close and affectionate with many of the ladies in court, but that could be just part of the culture. However, having said that, um, you know, uh, the French thought it at the time. So, you know, there was that perception. And the question is, what led to the perception? Well, one possibility is <laughs> Louis. Louis and his wife, there's nothing going, nothing happening for a while, right? There, no intimacy, no actual intimacy of, of between, you know, 1770 and the 1778. It's kind of a long time. So they're, I'm sure they're thinking something's going on, right? You know, maybe, maybe she's not interested in him. So maybe he, she's interested uh, in him. But she was interested in many men. There's a whole list of men that she was interested in. Did you? So anybody knows that. But yeah, uh, that was the popular perception, but I'm not sure uh, if it is valid or not. And uh, there have been movies that have come out lately that have depicted her as being lesbian or being bisexual. And once again, it's hard to know. It's hard to know from by our understanding of those ideas today and put that within the context. Possible. I can't say yes or no. no. Uh, <clears throat> it's like how the French refer to any sex involving spanking as English style. Yeah. French don't get along with a lot of people. <laughs> you know, I like the Germans on one side, I don't like the English on the other. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. So you have this this tug of war there. But, uh, and of course, printing, the printing press uh, obviously has been existing for a while there, but it's really spreading uh, these kinds of ideas because it sells. And in fact, there are lots of stories of Marie Antoinette uh, having, throwing these crazy, crazy parties. And uh, some of these writers are using their imagination. They know it sells. They, they just make stuff up. They make stuff up. Uh, and it's good stuff because it sells, but um, I don't think that she was involved in what they say. Yeah, good question. Though. Any other questions? Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, on the Catholic Church, weren't they already against liberal ideas since the Peasant War in Germany? Uh, uh, yes and no, because they're, they're still not seeing it in, within the context 
of this of this Lockean conception, you know, Montesquieu. Does that make sense? They're not seeing it from the enlightened perspective. So they're against these, yes, they're against those ideas, but they're against enlightenment thought and their understandings of those kinds of democracies. That's that's the difference there. Uh, did they get more direct about it after France took their lands? Um, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, by the way, you know, um, you know, we're taking all your property away, <laughs> and uh, and we're we're putting the clergy under under our we're paying them uh, under in a secular, you know, they're not being paid by the church anymore; they're being paid by France, <laughs> and, you know, and uh, yeah, and of course the whole thing of oh, let's just get rid of Christianity altogether. That kind of kind of got them upset too, just a, just just a little bit. Like, well, we'll close down the churches and we'll tear things down. So they got a little bit mad. Yeah, <laughs> talk about understatement, right? You know. So, oh, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, Robespierre. Uh, he, you know, I got to tell you that he was not. He was actually uh, not for this this uh, this cult of reason. He thought he thought it was. I mean, he thought it was crazy. Now, if Roosevelt thinks something's crazy, Maximilian Roosevelt, uh, uh, it's it's a uh, it's 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 got to be it's got to be pretty crazy. So, uh, so he, uh, he he proposed uh, the cult of the supreme being to replace the cult of reason. Uh, that way, at least we get a kind of a deistic god. <laughs> so, so there you have it. Uh, but uh, like I said, uh, that was pretty bad. It's pretty bad when the Catholic Church, Church and Maximilian agree on something. <laughs> you know, it's extreme. Man. Yes, uh, any other questions? Sorry. You just can't make this up. You know, what I like about the French uh, during the revolution is like any change of any change of mind or they have to create another committee. It's a nightmare of bureaucracy. It really is. It's like, oh, what's a new idea. Let's form another convention, another committee. You know, and what I found with my students is that the worst part when it comes to the time for the exam is trying to keep all these committees in order. Trying to figure out which did which and what overlapped what. Uh, it, it, it really is a it really is a nightmare. Um, so it's, it's a reign of terror of bureaucracy too. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, the Catholic Church uh, weren't they already? Oh no, no, no. Oh, thank you. I'm oh, sorry. We have the same question again. Sorry. But any other questions? Well, that was a, that was that was a lot. I, you know, I, I worked for that one. <laughs> I really did. You know, and I you know I cut out a lot of information too. You can't believe how much I cut out. Uh, but. Um, so hopefully I did some kind of justice. I hit the I hit the mountain peaks. Although I should probably shouldn't say the word mountain, right? You know, I, yes, uh, I don't want to move mountains, or I actually do want to move mountains. Even mountains. I think that's the I think that's the, I think there should be a movie. There is. I think there should be a mountain. Sorry, mountain. There should be a movie that's just simply called the mountain. I think that would be an ominous movie. You know, those who watch and wait and quietly make plans. That's I mean, that's scary. That slowly they plot, right? All right. Okay, so it looks like we I answered all those questions. So what am I talking about next time? Oh, okay. I'm talking about you you just don't want me to rest, do you? So apparently uh, I'm gonna be talking about ancient Mycenaean linear B tablets. <laughs> you just want my brain to go, go from French Revolution. Uh, to a text analysis. Well, don't worry, it's going to be interesting. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be talking about what the texts say. Yeah, we're going to go through and go through a few texts and talk about what they say and how it tells us about uh, the ancient Greeks, the Mycenaeans, uh, during the 14th, 1300s BCE, and gives us a nice context because this happens to be the same setting as the fall of Troy. That's right. So we have documents from that time. Yay. <laughs> we get to go over. Is that cool? Yeah. So in fact, I, I will just for fun, 
I will teach you a little bit of ancient Mycenaeum. Would you guys like that? And how to read it a little bit? We'll do that. So why not make more work for myself? So <laughs> you can't have anything more different than French Revolution, <laughs> uh, Mycenaean Linear B. But um, I think I can do it. Uh, my brain may explode, but it's okay. Uh, any any other questions or thoughts? Oh, wait. Uh, Dorian says, honestly, part of how you describe Robert here reminds me of a modern politician. And now I can't get the image of him calling um, King Louis, Meatball Louis, out of my head. Yeah, right? Yeah, Meatball Louis. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, you're right about modern um you're right, you're right about modern politicians. I won't say anything, but he does resemble a few a few uh, politicians that I've, I've I've seen at times. It has some of the same kinds of strategies and the same ways of thinking of themselves. It's a little bit worrisome, but uh, uh, there you have it. So hopefully, hopefully we won't have anybody like that take any kind of power um, within the United States. But you never know. And maybe this is an object lesson. Maybe we can take a, a takeaway from the French Revolution is, is what was said, right, by the British observing it, that a revolution should still have a moderating force. Things need to be done in, in, incre in increments and not right away because people can't handle immediate, complete change. I mean, that seems to be another lesson. Because once the people go, hey, we can change everything, the populists, they're fickle. They'll always change their minds. And look at what we got. We did the French Revolution is not a French Revolution. It's French revolutions. We got multiple ones. So we have to be very careful. I am all for freedom. I am all for liberty. But I'm not for any reign of terror. And I'm not into censoring those who who believe other than myself. And, and that's happening right here in the United States. We've seen censorship rise in defense of certain liberties. It's the same kind of irony that happened with the French Revolution. I think it's a cautionary tale. Yeah, so uh, isn't that unavoidable with the current march of technology? It is, it is. And so we may have to start thinking differently when it comes to even with our technology. And where does that come from? Our educational system. You know, we have to start young. We have to, we have to think in a new way. But are we ready for that? Some of us are, some of us aren't. But yeah, no, I agree with you. Yeah, you know, the genie is, uh, is, is out of the bottle. The internet genie is out of the bottle. And, uh, but we still can uh, maybe give us three wishes. <laughs> you know, so, you know. Yeah. Anything else? Any other great? Great, door. I love your questions. Any other, any other bits and pieces? Okay. So uh, I think I'm going to ride into the sunset. And I'll say good night. Farewell. Au revoir. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming.